Hello and welcome to the Nitty Gritty Writing Podcast. I'm Simon Canton. And I'm Ed Solomon. Uh, and welcome to Ed, who's, this is, you might, uh, you might have seen him two weeks ago, he was a guest, but now he's an actual co-host on the show. Yay! Uh, so welcome. <laughs> it's terrific. I'm, I'm, I can honestly say I'm very happy to do this. Cool. Um, so today we're going to be talking about dealing with jealousy, but before we do that, we'll do our usual weekly roundup or uh, bi-weekly in Ed's case, since he hasn't been on for two weeks. Yeah. Uh, do you want to go first? Sure, sure. Um, you know, a little bit of stuff again around the house, as always, a regular normal guy life. Uh, yeah, continue on. Oddly enough, because I'm home every other week, um, the same days I'll be doing this, I'll also be doing my honey-do lists. So, uh, and it's getting cold in Vermont, so I have to take down the inflatable pool still. Well, I have to empty it, it's taken down. Uh, was going to mow the lawn, but it's rainy here today, so not going to happen. Uh, we're decorating for Halloween. In terms of writing, um, few, very few uh, words were done on the, the cowboy, a cowgirl space project. I did get a little bit done, but not much. Did, in fact, start something new because, oh, look, shiny. Um, got all excited about uh, a concept that popped into my head. That actually, what had, what I, I guess, what had happened is I read, I read Blood Cruel, and you, uh, it got into my head that uh, uh, the whole uh, trope of deities and a kind of an American gods kind of thing started bouncing mm -hmm. around in my head, and then I immediately followed it by reading Dave Seven Stone, and uh, a serial uh, concept started bouncing around in my head. And those two smashed together. And uh, I wrote five 1,000-word chapters of a uh, deity-based uh, serial. Cool. Um, yeah, and, and I, I, I've been holding it back, but I think I might put it out on the magazine's website. But seeing as I've only got five 1,000-word uh, chapters, I'm going to hold it back until I've got about 10, seeing them with work already in the can so that I'm not rushing to keep out. That's about it for me. Uh, I've, as always, a few other things. I've got a, I've got a, a short story in a, a, a contest for a site called Quantum Muse, which is another free to submit um, site where you can not get paid, but you can get your exposure and, and critiquing. And uh, there's a Halloween contest and I threw one of my ghost stories that I wrote with my daughter into that and uh i'm waiting on the results of that but that's that's about it for for now yeah, that's plenty i think that was quite a lot yeah. <laughs> um i was going to check actually vermont and, and norway are probably at about the same like level north like we're yeah. probably at the, about the same uh, i i don't know what your summers are like but i i would imagine the winters very similar yeah we kind of have we have proper so when i was in ireland and um, before i moved uh there it's kind of uh, tep uh, like um it's okay temperatures like in the winter to be nine degrees and in the summer to be 24 degrees and overall it's just rainy and uh, but here it's actual like hot summers and then cold winters so oh, yeah <laughs> that's so probably the same yeah um so for me, uh, this week, I uh, released a book today um, called Fields of Dust, um, uh, which I was going to say had had a bad release, like a lukewarm reception, but then it's gotten better in the last few hours. So pre-orders for uh, Blood Cruel, as I mentioned, like I got about 50 sales on the first day. Uh, Fields of Dust, uh, I've now gotten about 24 sales, and it's still the first day. I mean, there might be some by the end of the day, but probably not. So about half as much. Um, so I'm kind of, the reason why I was releasing a bunch of new things is um, that I want to kind of try things out and see what catches on. So I'm going to see, uh, Dave and I have our uh, Dragons of Magic series starting in November. So I'm going to see what people want to read before I start committing myself to writing an entire series because obviously that would take a while. Um, so at the moment it looks like Blood Cruel is going to win um, because 
if I pick one series for next year, then I can probably, hopefully, release a book every two to three months. Um, and that will keep people interested in the series because it's ongoing. Whereas if I pick three, then I'm going to be releasing a book every six months or something, and people have forgotten what happened in the series and won't be interested. Um, so we're going to see. If uh, Blood Crawl is the best seller out of the three different series, then I'll um, continue that one. Uh, at the same time that's happening, I got feedback from a reader about uh, my Kairos Iron series, which still gets... I, I Oh, actually, I can mention I had a promotion um, last Saturday, I mentioned it, and that got me about 200 and something downloads. But because it then put me into the top 100, or even the top 10 of a category, a book blogger then picked it up and put it on his website, and then that got me 1,100 downloads of the Ooh. series starter. So that was great. Um, so yeah, I mean, you can't. So his book blog even says, do not contact me regarding books that you want me to look at, because I will not consider them. I only pick my own books, uh, which is always the ones I like best, because then you know like they've read it and liked it, and it's not just a, I need to fill my blog kind of thing. Right. Uh, and apart from that, I've been working on my beta reading thing, which is just going on and on forever, because uh, for the <coughs> the page where they're reading books, where readers are reading books, it's really difficult to get it to work on every single platform, because it needs to work on phones and tablets and PCs and Macs and Linux and all the rest of it. Um, and when I put my last book up on it, um, some people contacted me and said they didn't work on their phones. They had iPhones or they had whatever. Other people, uh, one guy said um, it didn't work on his Linux. It worked on his PC. It didn't work on his Linux machine. Didn't work on his Mac. I went well. Okay. When I when I get it sorted, I think I need to contact him and ask him to test because he has so many machines yeah. that that's really good feedback. Um, so yeah, I've been working on getting that. I want to get that page sorted because. The rest of the website, you can conceivably say that it on, it'll only work on desktop machines, like it'd be PC, Mac, and Linux. Um, you don't have to worry about telephones. But for someone reading a book, they have to be able to read on their phone or their tablet. Otherwise, you can't have them sitting at a PC to read an entire novel. That's stupid. So yeah, that's so that's probably going to be my plan for October, is fixing that app, because it's been waiting while I've done all these different books. And after that, as I say, I'll see how the sales go for Dragons and Magic to see if I'm going to write that next, depending on Dave's availability, of course. Um, even if he's unavailable or if he's not able to write books as quickly, I, I may start a new funny fantasy series to kind of complement that or something. Um, oh, one thing I could share. Um, if people have the patience to put up with me for a second longer. Uh, if I can find it, I'll share this. This is something I worked up in Excel. So I put all of my books into Excel. And then I said, OK, what genre are they? And then what subgenre are they? And then what tone are they? Um, to kind of try and figure out what, like if someone reads any of these books, which would be the next book in the series uh, that they should be pushed to. Um, and as you can see, like I got nine books in Sword and Sorcery now, uh, whereas, uh, and three in Military. And then after that, it's just a kind of a mishmash. Yeah. Um, so cyberpunk and post-apocalyptic and paranormal and space opera and like space opera obviously has three as well. Um, so I was trying to work out uh, what should I, I, I don't want to expand things so much that I've, I break up my, my readers, basically, that they're all, because uh, readers, as, as far as I can see, only want to read certain subgenres mostly. So what I don't want to do is start a little bit here and a little bit there and a little bit there, like Sean and Johnny talk about all the time that they do a little bit of every single thing, and then they don't build up momentum in any one thing. 
So that's the thing. I'm, things I've been thinking about. I, what I don't want to do is do what I did before, which is just rush into something, even if it's not selling. Um, if I'm going to do that, I want to do something that I really, really want to write. If it's not going to sell at all, then just write whatever. So uh, dealing with jealousy, which was um, a topic you want to talk about, uh, Ed. <laughs> nearly said, <laughs> nearly said Dave much, there. <laughs> it pretty much defines who I am as, as a creative. I'm, I, I spend every moment that I'm thinking about um, anything creative jealous. Um, every, everyone that I come in contact with, I seem to have a, some level of, of jealousy with. Um, constant. Um, not constant. I mean, I'm not. I'm not crippled, but uh, I can't listen to SPP without being jealous of of Shawnee, John, and Dave. Um, jealous, jealous of you and Dave, um, and and uh, I'm je jealous of people that that write for me for my magazine. I, I I get jealous as I have to edit for them, and there's always something that I'm jealous of them. I'm jealous of their speed. I'm jealous of their their quality of craft. I'm jealous that they have six books and I have one. I'm I'm jealous of their uh, word count per day. Basically, any successful thing you can mention about yourself as a creative is going to make me jealous. Uh, and and uh, if and I don't seem to acknowledge when someone is lesser than me. I'm much more focused on what somebody's doing better than me than what I do better than others. Oh, it, yeah, I mean, I, that's what I was going to say. If you went back two years and you were, so you were where you are then, and say David Ulner Slew, Slew was like someone else, you would be jealous of them, them then because they have a book out. Insanely. Exactly. Insanely. If, if you actually took it and broke it down into my, my alter ego pen name, I, I, in fact, at the beginning, I would uh, I, I perpetrate myself different online and I used to, I used to do conversations in the forum of Affilion where I, I, I spoke about how much I hated myself. <laughs> and they're, they're still, uh, it's still a matter of record. You, I, used to, I used to write under Ed Sullivan and then under David Olnerslew and, um, and, and actually have conversations in the forum where I told myself how much I hated myself. <laughs> uh, yeah. You know, because... In one way, I'm, I was definitely there before. I think I'm getting better. I hope I'm getting better about it. Because uh, Johnny, Sean, and Dave, it's difficult to watch their podcast and not get jealous of them. Because the main thing I think I'm jealous of is the amount of time they get to dedicate to writing. Um, because if I had, the, like I'm working 12 hours a day, but eight of those are uh, my day job, so I only get four hours, so they get three times as much as me. Uh, plus, Johnny and Sean are way, way better at book at marketing than I am because I'm a programmer, I'm not a marketer. Uh, and they had years and years of marketing experience, so obviously they're better at selling their books. Um, and I would say as well that uh, from talking to Sean, anytime I come up with an idea, Sean was there like. A year ago or two years ago. Oh yeah, I have that. That's on the back burner, and you know we're going to do something about that in the next month. Okay, great. <laughs> like, because I'm like, I can't do anything about this. Because I'm, I don't have enough speed. But you guys, I kind of offer it. Like, you guys have helped me so much. Here's something I've come up with. Yeah, yeah, we thought of that already. Um, <laughs> so you're kind of, Sean is just so smart and so good at the the business that you're kind of, yeah, okay, he's way ahead of me. Um. So, in a way, that's I, I've been jealous of them before, uh, but in a motivational way, I would say. So, in a kind of a yeah, but so one thing I think about a lot is in on a personal life side of things that I've got three kids and a mortgage and all the rest of it, um, and. So I'm kind of not in the financial place to do what they do. At the same time, if you've read Sean's book, if you read, um, is it is it Roger Dad or is it the no the one where he talks about it is it's autobiography basically. 
um, he went bankrupt <laughs> a bunch of times and lost houses and right. lost absolutely everything they had and was in, in with kids like in desperate trouble with with kids um so in a way it's difficult to you can't you can't fault him because he took the risks he really pushed um to become a full-time author um and it's difficult to be jealous of the result without doing the thing taking the risk that he took and at the same time i wouldn't want to take that risk i couldn't afford to lose the house and have be in that much of a, a bad situation especially um, where i live there's no it's very expensive um so yeah i mean i definitely get it i've been there before i think i'm getting better because i'm trying to focus on what i have that other people don't have um so while i only get four hours a day i get four hours a day um that's by the way more... jealous <laughs> just you saying that i'm jealous I, I don't get four hours a day and just you saying that i can already feel it welling up inside of me but it's where i get my four hours from that's the thing like so I wake up at five to five in the morning uh, and I w start work at seven, my day job. So I'm at the office maybe about 20 past five or half five or something like that. So that's an hour and a half before work. And then I don't take a lunch break. I just sit at my desk for the entire lunch. Uh, so that's another half an hour. And then after work, I stay until um, I go home uh, at about, half four or five which actually is going to change because myself and a co-worker have been talking about working out because i've been putting that off so for like the last six months i've been saying okay no physical exercise because i need to get these books done uh, but that's a stupid plan because obviously you drop dead if you do that <laughs> so then we have to work out so that's after work time gone so i'm going to be down to probably two hours instead of four Okay. Um, and then I go home and I make dinner and you know play with my son and all that kind of stuff. And then after uh, the youngest is in bed, I then go and work some more. So, um, in one in one way, I can understand why people would be jealous of that. But then it's it's difficult to say that it's difficult to come up with a reason why you'd be jealous because I have zero personal time. Like I work until I can't, and then I go to bed, and then I work again. And on the weekend, like I just spent Saturday working, and I'll probably spend Sunday morning working. Um. So that time is not like it's not like I have extra hours in the day. Um. I in fact I have to. What I'm jealous. I'm jealous of my wife. So my wife, um. There's like five percent of the world's population, something like that, who can who are comfortable on five hours or less of sleep a night. So it's not like she can't sleep more than five hours or she'll feel like crap because that's her sleeping in. Whereas I have to have eight hours or I have a blinding headache the whole day. So I'm jealous of her. She's got three extra hours in her day that I just waste lying on my back. Um, now, see, you, you when you when you just said that other thing, I want to let you know that I, I just instantly switched from being jealous of your time to being jealous of your commitment. <laughs> your sense of commitment. It's a, you can't win. I always find something. I always find something to be jealous of in in my peers. I would say, okay, so in terms of <laughs> in terms of time commitment, that's about deadlines. Um. So, I set a deadline and then I have to hit it. Um, and some people have said, oh, well, it's just makey uppy. So um, I was in a, um, I was going to be in a, a collection, uh, a compilation of, of stories, uh, and it wasn't going to happen in time. Like the deadline was, uh, see, 20th of August or something. And then we said, okay, we'll push it by a month to 20th of September. And then that, at about 7th of September, people were saying, oh, we're not going to hit the deadline there. Uh, and I said, okay, well, then I'm just going to release Fields of Dust on my own. Um, and they said, oh, well, one guy said, well, 
what does it matter? It's just a make you up date. We did. It's not. A, there's no publisher saying this is the date we're going to put it out. It's just us talking. Um, but I take those deadlines seriously. Like I had the book ready, so it could have come out in first of September. Um, so if I, as I said at the moment, I'm holding off on committing to anything because if I say that I'm going to make a book, get a book ready, say I said I was going to have the book ready by first of January, then it would be out first of January or before. Um, and after doing that for a while, it becomes a self-regulating thing, it's just a habit, where you go, okay, well, um, I should I, I should go back a second. Uh, so, uh, one, it's I've kind of done that since college, not on book related stuff, but uh, I will do the work as the semester is going. I did the work as the semester was going uh, in college, whereas everyone else would cram the last three days before the exam. Um, and then I would get A's and they would get D's or C's or whatever. Uh, and they go, oh, you're such a swat. But I wasn't, <laughs> like, but I wasn't doing massive amounts of work. I was doing a little bit of work <laughs> every single day. <coughs> Which they I, even. <laughs> I'm only laughing because I'm the guy that would cram and still get the A. Oh well, there you go. Or, 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 or at least, or at least the B plus, and people would be like, "I hate you." And actually, the B plus is a better analogy because I could have gotten the A had I behaved myself in 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 a in a proper fashion, but I didn't have to do that. So, and it was like, oh, oh good enough. I got the B plus, and I didn't have to. I didn't have to be responsible. Well, I got not, not 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 that that's a good thing. If the behavior shouldn't <laughs> be rewarded. No, I mean that's the the trouble is as well. So people have like natural gifts for things. Um, so some people can um, are really good at doing at learning just by sitting in the classroom or whatever. But for me, it's what I write down that I remember. So I'll just write something. I'll write down notes in the class, and then I'll just rewrite the notes and rewrite the notes and rewrite the notes until I memorized it. Um, and if I was just relying on what I so I actually I look back at my grades, and I failed the semester. I'd forgotten about it, but I failed the semester and the second semester of college. And uh, so at the time. It, so the the program I was in was was a state um, college, so if you got less than a C average, um, you were out after the certificate. So you get it. You had the chance to get a certificate in computer science or you know IT, um, but you wouldn't be able to do a diploma. And if you didn't get more than a B average, you wouldn't be able to do a degree. So I failed the second semester, and then it was. Well, if you fail, so the first year you could fail one semester and then make it up in the summer exams. But if you failed anything in the second year, then you weren't going to do the diploma at all. You had to have a C average in the second year. So then I kind of, that was a, a wake up call and I went, okay, well then I need to actually study and do it properly. And if I sat in the class, it was going to fail. And if I didn't do stuff outside. Um, and because, of, <laughs> well, it's marginally funny, I guess, but uh, I was in the library and I was making notes and a friend of mine came in and I was always socially awkward. I was very socially awkward in college uh, and he, he was making a joke. So I was making notes out of the book and he said, oh, can you do some for me? Like joking. And then he went off some other friends and I sat there in the library and I made him notes too. <laughs> and then I said, here's your notes. And he went, oh, I was only joking. You didn't have to do that. Um, but then for me, the benefit was writing the notes. I, like having the notes is pointless. It's it's It has to be in your brain. So you have to write the notes. Right. Um, so anyway, my point was that <clears throat> even in college, I would, I would do little, uh, I'd work out, OK, here's the deadline in three months' time. Therefore, each day I have to do this amount of work. And that's the same as I do now. I say, OK, well, I can write, on average, 1,800 words in an hour. 
it's sometimes faster, sometimes slower. Um, so that means that um, if I do two hours a day, that will take me so many days to write the first draft. And then editing is about 50% of the time. So double whatever it takes to write the first draft. Uh, and that's how long it's going to take me. So if I set a dead, I always set my deadlines fairly um, close to what that would be. I could give myself a little bit of leeway and then say, okay, well, then that's when it's going to come out. So then I can't slack off because if I slack off, then it's not going to, I'm not going to hit the deadline. If I don't hit the deadline, well, then absolutely nothing's going to happen other than I'll go, uh, oh, crap, I didn't hit a deadline. But um, yeah, I don't know. That's at least the way I push myself to do that. Right. The danger, of course, is that I push myself too hard, as I'm saying, like my health suffers when I'm um, working that hard because I've got no time to exercise or, um, and like I tend to compensate with food as well. If I'm overstressed, I'll just eat some extra or whatever, and that's not good either. I have to have some personal time um, or I'm gonna drop dead at 45 and then I get to write less books anyway. <laughs> that's true, yes. I, well, I take the per I take the personal time, and I have uh, small children, and uh, and I take the personal time because if I didn't, um, I would end up running a across uh, my wife, and she wouldn't she wouldn't accept it. Mm. But then on the other hand, if I take too much, um, she doesn't insist that I write, but she will be the one to say, you know, you haven't written anything in a while. Isn't it time for you to go to your office and and. Uh, and do something because she won't want to hear me complain about how I'm not accomplishing anything. So every once in a while she'll cue in and she'll say, um, you haven't done anything. You really should. So mm. it's, I mean, it's that's, a strange balance. That's why I wake up at five to five because at five o'clock in the morning, there's no one looking for me to do anything. And um, now I have to go to bed earlier, but at that time, my youngest son is in bed anyway. My two oldest are 18 years old and don't care what I'm up to. Um, like if I was watching TV or something, it's not like they'd watch it with me. Mm -hmm. So um, so I'm not losing hours where any family commitments would get in the way. Right. Um, and as well, I think I mentioned last week, I might have mentioned it, that my wife has, has um, had a family um, illness, an illness in her family. And she's been um, at the bedside of her um, favorite aunt for a month and a half or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, she just died of cancer like this week. Mm. Um, and whilst my wife has been busy, my time has been so limited because I rely on her a lot for, um, like I can't stay on and work until half four or five if she's not at home to pick the kid up from kindergarten or whatever right so that's a big thing as well so I don't know that's in terms of time I get why like I'm jealous of Johnny Sean Dave you, you might be jealous of me but but uh, there well, are I'm really je I'm very jealous of them I mean uh, if, uh, the, the concept of, of planning my day around not going to work and of course I have a fear that if I had that time I have a fear that I would I would I would squander more than I should if I oh, you know. I definitely would. At least for a while until I got my act together. Right. Uh, because when I have holidays, um I then plan to do lots of stuff and then do absolutely nothing. Like I'll, you know, binge some Netflix show or something. Um or, or a, a funny thing, a Mitchell and Webb, who are a comedy duo in <coughs> England, uh, um, talked about like this. It's a sketch show, and they're at a uh, you know a dinner party kind of thing, and uh, the woman comes up and he says, "Oh, David, have you met Robert? He's just started working from home." And uh, when the woman leaves, David goes, "Have you got over the compulsory masturbation phase yet?" <laughs> it takes it takes a month before you start actually working. <laughs> uh, 
Oh yeah. I, oh my god. Yeah. yeah was, <laughs> that was that was quite funny. But um, so I think you'd waste time on computer games and TV and other stuff. And uh, but after a while, you kind of. I think Johnny, Sean, and Dave were working from home before. Uh, oh, before yeah. they were ever writing books. Uh, I think Dave got laid off from the newspaper, but then he was doing his comic. So they were working from home. It's, they were used to that routine. Oh, yeah. They're, 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 not, they're not amateurs at, at working from home. They've, they've already survived the, that phase, if you will, and the computer game phase, and they've already come through the other side. And mm. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so yeah, I, I get the jealousy bit there, but um, for me at least, I've been, uh, as I've mentioned before, I've been watching this guy, Evan Carmichael's videos, who's really good, who on YouTube, who um, he said that he said 200,000 subscribers or 300,000 subscribers or something, and he, he occasionally will sit down and go, okay, what marketing plan could I do? To get to two million subscribers or three million subscribers, right? And then, so he thinks about that for a while, and then he thinks, "Yeah, but I could do that. I could dedicate my time to that, or I could dedicate my time to making the videos better, and then people will share them more, and then people will subscribe more." Um, which I think there's a lot of truth in that. Uh, I've does, kind does of taken that. Work, that to does that work for the books, though? Do you feel like? Because there's people out there with absolutely phenomenal books who just don't seem to get the shares. Like, I think that's it's so. the The trouble is we're in a, a situation where there's a big time investment involved in reading a book, where there isn't in watching a YouTube video that's ten minutes long or twenty minutes long or something, uh, or a song. Like if you said, "Hey, check out this band." It's a three-minute song. You can listen to a three-minute song, like, and go, "Oh, I don't really like it," or whatever. And there's no big loss. Um, whereas a book, you might be talking ten hours to read a book. Um, uh, that said, there are books that have made massive, have been massively successful just on the strength of word of mouth. Like, it takes longer, I think. Like you get um, Game of Thrones, for instance. Um, which, <laughs> yeah, which, Forever. which, which, like, yeah. I mean, he he takes a long time to write it, but he's been writing what since eighty eight or ninety or something. Oh, that's what I meant. I meant he he wrote. He, it's not like that was an overnight success. No, absolutely. He started writing that, and nobody even cared about that until, God, years in. Mm. Or um, uh, Fifty Shades of Grey. Like that's another like. We may not like the the books, yeah. but they were successful on word of mouth. They were successful, right. um, success, successful uh, fan fan fiction first, and people went, "This is so good, it should be a book." And then she wrote it as a book and released it, and then people read it and liked it so much that they said, "Oh, you should read this." Um, I think. Uh, one thing that can trip us up, at least I've been thinking about this recently, is uh, not taking enough risks. Because if your book is good, but it's not um, different, so if you, so I've written my bitter end series. You've got your your um, six thing queen, yep. and I could say that I'm I'm, I could say that they're similar books, um, that. If I read Bitter End or I read Six Saint Queen, either of them would be about the same level of quality, about the same kind of thing, like lighthearted sword and sorcery kind of fantasy. Yeah. Uh, and there's nothing in those, I would say, that would make me go, you have to read this one. Forget about Bitter End, read Six Saint Queen because this. Yeah. Um, like, so I was watching Graham Norton, uh, who does a chat show in England today. I know him. Uh, yeah, and uh, Daniel Radcliffe was on, and he was talking about Swiss Army Man, and Justin Timberlake was on too, and Daniel Radcliffe said, okay, so it's about this guy who's like about to kill himself, and a corpse washes up, and the guy can't kill himself, and within five minutes, he's riding the corpse around like a jet ski, 
and Justin Timberlake went, I have to watch this movie. <laughs> this sounds amazing because that's something you haven't seen in any other movie. Uh, Deadpool, like you've got your Deadpool clock behind. Oh, yeah. Like you could watch, you could watch Avengers and you can watch Iron Man and you can watch whatever, but you couldn't get what Deadpool was giving in any other movie. That's why everyone went and saw Deadpool. Um, it's, so, why it's why Guardians of the Galaxy did better than Avengers. Yeah, exactly. Guardians of the Galaxy. People saw that trailer and went, oh, that. I want to watch that. Um, and so what I've been thinking recently is that we need to push the boat out more. We need to think more risky, not try and... Like, there's all this writing to market thing, which Chris, Chris Fox talks about. And I totally get that. And if you're really good at marketing, um, or you push enough money behind it or whatever, uh, which he's excellent at marketing, then right into market, you have, if if Bitter End or Sixteen Queen or whatever, if we were really good at marketing, mm. they are the same kind of thing. So you'd be able to push to the readers who like that kind of thing and you would right. get loads of sales. But if you're not good at marketing, then you have to be better at writing, I think. And if you're gonna be better at writing instead of being better at marketing, then you have to have something that's like Swiss Army Man, where someone goes, "Oh, dude, read this book. You will not, you cannot imagine what's in this book." Um, so, I don't know. That's what I've been thinking recently. Like you've got me. I'm looking over the the monitor at my wall, my idea parking lot, looking for the weirdest thing now. I'm like, "Oh no, no, that's Western. No, no." I'm like, I'm looking for the completely odd thing. The <clears throat> <laughs> but it has to fit a genre as well so you can get people initially to read it. So if you wrote sword and sorcery fantasy, but you had some wacky idea in it, um, that then people went, oh, I've never seen this before. Like you were saying about Blood Cruel that it's like American Gods. And it is. It's not like there isn't an idea in that that's so out there that people went, oh, my God, you have to read this book. Whereas if I wrote the next book, if I could come up with something that didn't break the genre, I don't want to destroy, I don't want to destroy for the people who enjoy that genre. I want something that's so unique and compelling that people go, yeah, the first book is just normal vampire stuff with some God stuff thrown in. And then the second book will just blow your socks off because of this. That will get people to read the series yeah. if that's the one I end up writing. I, I burned myself with when my world built for Sixteen Queen. Uh, the second book was actually the first book, and Sixteen Queen was the second thing c conceptualized and the first written. And honestly, the interesting, the most interesting stuff, the most wha out there stuff, is story-wise, is like in the fifth or sixth book, and mm. that made it hard on me. There's 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 things I've got built into the world that just could not come out early on. And that's, yeah. So, and, and, and I don't know if I regret it. I don't know if it'll ever come to light because if nobody ever reads Sixteen Queen, it, there won't be a fifth book. I mean, I'll just be very honest. There's not going to be a book five if nobody reads book one. Uh, and, you but know. is it, but could you skip to book five? Like, can you have it as a flashback or a backstory or something and, I've got just, it considered, and actually, it's 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 spread out on the idea on the world building phase. I've got um, things can happen um, at the same time. The second book has to happen after the first, but other things can happen. And you know, and honestly, I mean, I I can come clean. The the, the weirdness of it wasn't really prevalent in the first book, and it gets better in the second. It's I I am, and of course, I'm not that. I'm not saying that this is that creative, but the the Tolkien esque pantheon in in Sixteen Queen is is flipped on its head, which is is just a Star Trek mirror universe kind of trick, where um, you know ogres are smart and and trolls are are smart, and uh, elves are are nasty evil dirty things, and dwarfs are are also nasty evil dirty things, and uh, you know. Uh, Basically, whatever you think of, of a Tolkien race, flipping on its head, uh, dirty, nasty, vile elves, and 
rather intelligent orcs and ogres and and you know dwarves are scum and and other than the humans everything is is flipped around and and kob kobolds are actually uh good fighters who are, who are relatively smart and useful in there and uh yeah, that's not by no, by no means is that a great idea that's you know award winning that all you're doing is turning things around but there's a really good idea as to why it's all like that and mm -hmm. uh it's, it, it's hard to, to bring out it's i don't like i said i don't know if it'll ever come out because there's other things i want to do i i as right now the way i feel is i i, I think i want to write the sequel for that in november for nanorimo which is another chance getting back to the topic another chance for me to be envious of of large numbers of people <laughs> um <laughs> and 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 it and it and it definitely caters to the to the base instinct of jealousy because you you throw your word count up there and then you get to watch all your friends have a higher word count so uh and you know and then of course last year i didn't get the click win because i i i uh, I, I just fizzled out. So uh, yeah, that's that's the perfect example of of envy. Watching people's word count by day that'll get you. That's that's the thing. I was I was in the I'm still in this group called Last Author Standing, and uh, we were putting up um, like ranked who wrote the most words for a month, and who was writing the most words per day, and all that kind of stuff. And it really helped me um, and myself and Dave actually were kind of neck and neck for a while. And then um, there's an author called H. Gibson. She was miles ahead. And um, oh, I forget, there was someone else, another author who was way ahead. Like they were writing 10,000 words a day or 20,000 words a day or whatever. I was like, okay, well, I can't compete with that. But me and Dave were kind of, one of us would be winning and then the other and so on. And for me, that was perfect because I was just competing with Dave pretty much. I'd ignore places one and two and just say, okay, well, I'll try and get, or I'd try and win for one day. I'd go, okay, can I possibly write a bunch of words today so I can win? And, but there was about 30 people in the group maybe. And for 26 people, it was the worst possible thing they said they would look at that they'd look at how many words say i was writing two and a half thousand words in a day and they go off oh, i can't write two and a half thousand words so this is pointless they'd look at at h gibson or the other authors totals and go jesus how could i ever write that much i should give up writing entirely so it's a very personal thing and i think nanorimo people should consider if competition hurts them rather than helping them for me, NaNoWriMo would be like, okay, can I break the top 10,000 or whatever it happens to be? Like, could I, um, if I say one year I broke top 10,000, can I break the top 1,000? Or, you know, competition helps me, but it seems to harm more people than it helps. So I think people need to consider, is it beneficial or is it just depressing when you don't hit your target? Just 50, I, I, I can tell very clearly what it is for me. If I'm hitting the target, I'm good. I get envious of people who have high word counts, but as long as I'm hitting the daily target, I'm good. The minute I start to fall behind, it definitely negatively affects me. Mm -hmm. So if, I, if, I'm, if I'm getting my 16, 1,660 words, and I'm hitting my daily targets, and I'm on track, it's positive. The minute that I fall behind, it becomes a little negative and then more negative and then more negative. And then if I get five, five, ten thousand words behind, I pretty much have lost the event. Yeah, and and the goal is to produce a book that you are proud of and you want to publish, not to finish it within November. So like life happens. Like I so one thing I do is I try and get ahead. So if I have to finish at a certain date, I'll try and write more than I need to write every day. So I'm ahead. So then if if my wife rings up and says, oh, I'm sick, can you pick up Alex from the kindergarten? Then go, well, I'm ahead. That's okay. Um, 
or right now, like I'm like, okay, I've got no books on my schedule until I find out what I want to write. Like, it's okay to kind of give yourself some slack, but if if it's just a raw total, like you have to write this much every day, uh, or you're a failure. <laughs> that's that's not a good thing for most people. Yeah. Um. And as I said, for last author standing, it helped me. It didn't help most people, and most people stopped. And for some people, they said that it had put them off so much that they didn't write for two months or whatever. That's not helping anyone. No. Uh, in that case, you shouldn't do those kind of competitions. You should just do the best you can and allow yourself to uh, some leeway. Allow yourself to say, OK, well, today you have to be careful because it's you can slip into the, well, today I'm tired, or today I'm in a bad mood because of whatever. I had an argument with my boss or something. You can't let that happen. But you can let, like, oh, my wife is sick, so I need to pick up my kids. That's allowed. <laughs> like That's a, a thing that's allowed to happen. Right. Um, so yeah, I mean, and, and I could get jealous of, of the authors who were ahead of me in Last Author Standing, I could say, well, I can't write 20,000 words a day. This sucks. I could write a book in a week if I could write that much. Right. But that's not possible. I couldn't. Um, what The fastest I've ever written a book was um, Planet Zero, which was 60,000 words in, or 65,000, whatever it was, in a week. Um, but it was a, a stretch of a week. It was nine days more than it was five. I work both weekends because my uh, wife and son were away on holidays. Um, so that's not something I could do regularly. That's something I did once and probably will never repeat. Even if I was full time, I wouldn't be working that much on my weekends and working 12 hours on, on my weekdays and pushing everything into it. So just have to say 20,000 words a day isn't possible for me. All right. If if I if I if I wrote on the schedule that you do, where where you wake up early, and I, because I've done that, I'd say mm -hmm. I'm good for about twelve to fifteen thousand words a week. Yeah. If I had no job, um, I would easily be able to do a novel a week. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm saying all things being considered, uh, my I write extremely fast and. My first drafts are very clean. When you hear Johnny say, "Oh, my my first my first drafts are very clean," uh, in terms of having to be edited, uh, my biggest thing is that my creative nature screws me up. I procrastinate. I get lazy. I let the things you just said. Oh, I'm tired. And blah blah blah. blah. And then what? When I, I squander what little time I have, and there's not that much to be squandered. If you only have two hours, and you screw up an hour and fifteen minutes of it, well, then you've only got forty-five minutes. If you have eight to ten hours to write, and you screw up an hour, it's a much less it's much less of a blow. You can't screw up three fourths of your writing time with procrastination and expect to still produce uh, the same results. So. That's I mean I, I for me at least I'd had to do the opposite. If I have eight hours, then I'll go, I'll do it later, I'll do it later, I'll do it later. Oh, there's no more time. Whereas if I've got an hour or two hours, the le least amount of time possible, the more motivated I am to do it right away. Um because there is only that time or it doesn't get done at all. Right. Uh, if there's eight hours, it's like, yeah, but you know, um this is out on Netflix or whatever it happens to be. Um, but another thing I, I saw recently was Stephen King was talking to George R. R. Martin, and George R. R. Martin said, "Oh, I'm so jealous of you because you write so quickly." You know, Stephen Stephen King is 35 books out, something like that, in mm -hmm. 35 years, maybe a book a year or something like that. And George R. R. Martin's jealous of him because George R. R. Martin's books only are out once every five or six years. Uh, and Stephen King said, yeah, but there are books and there are books. Like you could write a book every six years and it's a book half the world wants to read or see the TV show off or whatever. Or you could write a book every month and no one gives a shit. I mean, 
Right, right. It's not about the it's not about the speed as much as it's about I think as well um it's about what it means to the author, what it means to you for writing it. If you write a book and it takes you a year or two years or three years uh, and and there's very few people who want to write it, but it was something that you've been dying to write your whole life, well, then that's a success. How could it not be? Like, you've written something you really, really wanted to get out there. And saying that, oh, well, it didn't sell a million copies, or um, it took me three years and someone else could have written it in a month or a, a week or whatever it happens to be. Sure, they could, but they wouldn't have written your book. They would have written their own book, and they would have written something that maybe would not have encapsulated what you put into your book. I took so, a year and a half, and I produced something that I don't feel is my life's work, and I, I'm proud of it. I like it, but I don't feel like I wrote the great American novel. I don't feel like I changed the genre. I don't feel like I made... A huge impact. I like it. It's mm. decent. Um, so that's I, the thing. So, so I, I mean, and that 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 speaks to the psychology of it just just as well. Um, I I I wrote to market, and it's amusing and it's humorous. You know, I often I, I often hear the way you speak about bitter end, and I do. I think I feel similar about uh, sixteen queen. Um, that it's I like it. It's it's good. Do I feel like I changed anything significantly? Do I feel like I changed the world or even the genre? No, it's fairly decent Half tongue-in-cheek half action sword and sorcery It's it's good and 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 you know it's that the little part of you still wants to change the world or at least the genre I mean you you want to write the Martian mm. and 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 have people fawning all over you telling you that you know you're now one of the this is bound to be a classic um, <laughs> you know he yeah. he's, he's got people who tell him you know you just wrote a, a science fiction piece that people are going to be talking about when you're dead so yeah i mean if you look at george orwell he wrote yeah. four or five books and you know took a long long time to write them but people are talking about 1984 and animal farm still um so i don't know i think for me at least i don't regret any book i've written because none of them are all of them are readable they're entertaining entertaining um my favorite still um is is um the bite of rust which is the fifth book in the veteran series and um, just because that was something i was burning to write and i wrote it so why the hell am I, why would the hell would I write something that I'm not burning to write? If I consider, so what I've been thinking as well recently is I've got a day job. I don't have to worry about my mortgage. Um, like some of the guys out there, full-time writers, they don't get to write whatever they're burning to write because they have to write the next detective novel or romance novel or whatever they're, right. they're writing. I can write whatever I want. I can write whatever, I, like I could turn around and I might, and disappoint some readers, but I could say, okay, all the series I'm writing right now, they're gone. I'm never going to write anything more in them. I'm going to write this. This is really, really want to write. And they go, oh, come on, like you left us hanging with this or that or without and whatever. And I would, that obviously would um, affect me because I want to write the best books possible for readers. But at the same time, I can say, yeah, I know, I know, I know you want to read that, but this is what I really, really want to write right now, and I have to concentrate on what is important for me. Mm -hmm. I think, it, you know, listening, and I, a bit, I've watched, I've listened, mostly listened instead of watched before I joined the show, it seems like you've come a long way with adjusting your mindset properly, which, which goes mm -hmm. a long way to, to have, feeling the right way, and, and, and perhaps that's something I need to do in, in certain aspects. Like just you saying, like I've heard you say that in this show and in a past show, the, I, I have the freedom to do what I want because of where I'm at. That is, 
that's a whole lemons lemonade thing looking at what what are my advantages as an author what makes it good to be me right now and and uh keeping that in mind i think that helps a lot in in uh being successful at wherever you're at uh, kind of an appreciate where you're at and what what are the pros rather than the cons of of my position right now and mm. that's that's a good thing that i probably need to adapt more into myself i mean yeah, and I think, I don't know if it's true for everyone, but if I, if the next project I come up with an idea and I'm going, oh, I have to write this, well, then it's going to get done faster anyway because there's not going to be the, oh, I'm tired or I, I'm in a bad mood or whatever. It's this has to get done. This is amazing. I really want to write this. Like, That's why we want to be authors, surely, is because we love writing. So let's not let's not adjust our expectations so much that we go, yeah, but this has to sell. So it has to be written to market. So it has to match this and it has to match that. And it has to do this and it has to do that. No, like write whatever you want to write. Um, and as long as you accept that maybe no one buys it, but okay, but that's, that's a different goal. Like if your goal is to be a millionaire or whatever, Maybe you you just ape someone else's style, and then you get really good at marketing, and then you market like crazy. Not that I'm saying anyone is doing that. I'm just saying that that is right. something you could do. do you, or do you, you can still, say, do you still have days where you where you where you wish I, I want to be a millionaire, and then the next day, no, I want to be an artist, and then because I I go that I, I maybe it's not a day to day switch, but the, I want to I want to write to market. I want to I want to be rich. I want to do this. I want to quit my job. And then other days I get an overwhelming feeling of what you're saying where, uh, no, I want, I want to be true to, to, to what I want. Absolutely. Like, so uh, we've got all this crap that's wrong with our house. And I'm like, well, if I was a successful author earning a million dollars a year or whatever it was, then we wouldn't have drainage problems around the house and we wouldn't have a, uh, we've got a, old oil-based heating system where the tank in the garden by government mandate has to be taken away next year and that's going to cost two grand two thousand dollars or whatever uh so those kind of things are a pain in the ass because uh, or taking my kid to disneyland like i really want to take so alex is five that's the perfect age to go to disneyland but we can't afford it and I'm like but if i was a successful author i could do this and i could do that that's that's what I want. And it's not like, that's not an amazing financial goal, like to have enough to go to Disneyland for a few days. Um, but at the same time, you am I putting something onto writing that it might never be? Like I something I can control is I can write the books that I really, really, really want to write. I can't control what sells at least and let, not unless I become a marketer and get really good at it and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So that's it's just a choice you have to make. It, and I think for me, I, I, I definitely go back and forth. But at the moment, I'm in the phase of, yeah, but what do I want to write that will, f for me, if I read it, would be the best book I've written, I've read in a long time, like reading The Martian or reading. Um, Ready Player One was another excellent book, or like those are the ones, or The Girl with All the Gifts. I've read those and I've gone, oh, that's amazing. <laughs> so, what would be a book that I would read that I could possibly write where I'd go, that's amazing? I haven't read Ready Player One, but the other two have, I, I, I proclaim those two publicly as the two best books I read last in the past year The Girl with All the Gifts and, and The Martian. Uh, yeah. Because uh, again, they did something that I hadn't read in other other books. Uh -huh. So The Martian, I've read tons of science fiction, um, as you can see behind me, and I hadn't read a book that was that realistic. Um, Andy Weir put so much into getting it to make scientific sense. Uh, the Girl with All the Gifts, um, I don't want to spoil any of it because even the first page I think you don't even read reviews or read the product description. Just buy it and read it because the first page I wouldn't want spoiled. Um, and that had something so unique to it that 
I hadn't seen anywhere else. So I read the hell out of it. I didn't and read it. I I I I, uh, I read The Martian, and the girl with all the gifts was an audio book I did. Oh yeah, cool. And it was phenomenal that way. It was phenomenal yeah. listening to it. So. Um. So the things I thought that. Um. Like uh, so, going back to the one I always mention, Stainless Steel Rash. If I had read a lot of other science fiction first, yeah. and then had read Stale and Steel Rat, I don't know that it would have had the impact on me that it did. But because I read it first, it had a big impact. Um, so yeah, I mean, I just think, for me personally at the moment, I'm trying to think of what's the thing that I could write right now that would make, if I read it, would make me go, oh my god, this is amazing. And that, then why not write that? Why write something? just to satisfy a market or even to satisfy a small group of readers like write what we want to write that's why we want to be authors anyway we're coming up on an hour so we should probably yep. wrap things up okay um was there anything you want to mention at the end no no i feel like this was a good a good conversation and we we we, we kind of drift back and forth but it was it was all <laughs> centered around around jealousy and uh you know and and psych psychology and the you know mm. I'm sure I'm sure we sh we could probably do th three we could probably do one of these every every fourth or fifth show and it would be different so yeah as I say it's it's <laughs> it's personal like I'll like if you come back in six months time I could go fuck artistic vision I want to earn some money, money so <laughs> <laughs> anyway we should probably end there um, yeah. Thank you all very much for watching, and we will see you on the next one. Bye.